The king of the North Cascades, few mountains in Washington compare to the isolation and savage beauty of Good Mountain. At 9,200 feet, not only is it one of the most challenging mountains to climb in the North Cascades, but it is also the highest. Yet, it is so remote that it is not visible from any road and seldom recognized outside of climbing circles. Just getting to this mountain will require an approach in excess of 15 miles each way, accompanied by bushwhacking, river crossings, and open country travel. There are two main routes to Good Summit. The easiest of these two is not easy, a class 4 to 5 exposed climb up a loose rock gully on the south side of the mountain known as the Southwest Couloir. The other and more common choice for summit-bound climbers is the Northeast Buttress, a steep exposed rock buttress rising nearly 3,000 feet above the glacier below. This route, unlike the south side routes, is mostly on solid rock. At a YDS rating of 5.5, it is an enjoyable ascent for those willing to brave the challenging approach, which will include a mix of long trails, some bushwhacking, exposed scrambles, a significant creek ford, and a dangerous glacier crossing. There are multiple ways of accessing the mountain, starting from Stahican, Cascade Pass, or Rainy Pass. The route from Stahican is the shortest, but not by much. A ferry trip up Lake Chelan is required to reach Stahican, and a shuttle service runs from there to the trailhead. Washouts in 2003 closed the road to cars at High Bridge, so this is where the hiking will begin. Round trip this route is between 25 and 30 miles of hiking. Due to the time expense of taking the ferry, most prefer to utilize the Rainy Pass approach, which is slightly shorter than Cascade Pass. This route will be between 35 and 40 miles of hiking. We started from the Pacific Crest Trail Junction, just east of Rainy Pass. From here we followed the PCT for 10 miles as it descended along Bridge Creek. At 10 miles in, we turned north, heading up the North Fork Bridge Creek Trail for another few miles. This area is in the heart of the North Cascades. Black bear populations are strong here. We saw two bears on different parts of the trail just on the way in. If you plan on camping in this valley, be cautious with food storage and camp. Three miles up North Fork Bridge Creek Trail, we found an easy log crossing to get across Grizzly Creek to access the remaining one mile of trail to reach the North Fork Bridge Creek. The trail will get within one or two hundred feet of the creek and then a climber's trail will direct towards the creek. Usually the best crossings are here, although in the early season you may need to hunt for them as the water level drops substantially over the month of July. This was late July, meaning the ford was trivial, but in early July and before, this part of the approach can be extremely dangerous and possibly prohibitive. After crossing the creek, we located a rock gully cutting through the alder fields to lead to the base of a waterfall on the south side of the first cliff bands. A bit of class three and four scrambling up slabby but mostly solid rock got us above this band. Here is where bushwhacking will come into play. A faint climber's trail will run through the slide alder for most of the way to the open meadows above, but it becomes increasingly difficult to follow as it gets higher, and most parties bushwhack at least to the very end of it. As far as bushwhacking goes, however, this is nothing. It took maybe 20 minutes to get out of this alder. For real Cascade bushwhacking, check out our visit to the Cleopatra Mine. Above the alder, the route finding becomes easy, following rock is to the base of the slabs below the glacier. Here is a good place to find a campsite, and there are some available at 5,400 feet and 5,600 feet. From camp below the slabs, we ascended class two and three terrain at a direct south heading to reach the base of Good Glacier. On our trip, the glacier was the most hazardous part of the climb. Warm temperatures can spur icefall and rockfall activity. We had a refrigerator-sized boulder from the cliffs above shoot down the mountain past the glacier only 100 feet or so from us. From the buttress, we witnessed a moat collapse that sent car-sized ice debris sweeping the glacier where the route traverses. Minimize time on this glacier, and especially on hot days, consider an alpine start. To get onto the glacier by the late season, most entrances are solid ice. We chose the less steep but broken up icefall option, which seemed okay. The alternative was an exposed but less broken ice ramp that looked like it could use an ice screw or two. Traversing the glacier to the foot of the buttress at 6,800 feet got us to the moat. Late season attempts may find this part challenging, but we had a collapsed snow bridge to gain the buttress that made it easy. An important note here, no water existed on the route past this point. Late season ascents should plan on taking enough water to last until reaching the snowfields on the southwest side of the mountain. After melting enough snow for our climb, we began the two fifth-class pitches to gain the buttress proper. A few options exist for this part. The first pitch, we ascended a mostly class four ramp on climber's left, followed by a pitch of low fifth-class directly up to reach a flat area just left of the buttress crest. 
From what I've heard, this must be the easiest way. Once on the ridge, we stayed just to the left of the ridge, scrambling easy class 3 and 4 rock for 700 vertical feet. At about 8,000 feet, we moved back onto the ridge crest and followed it directly until 8,200 feet when the buttress blends into the cliff face. This is when the fifth class climbing resumes. The easiest route we found was moving climbers right up the buttress into a gully that appears around 8,200 feet. This gully may funnel rock fall, so exercise extreme caution to avoid sending rocks down on parties below you. We pitched the remainder of this section to reach the Bibby Ledge at 8,500 feet, which is unmistakable. The ledge was big enough for a small two-person tent and maybe a couple other individual bivvies. From here, the views are one of a kind and a one of a kind place to spend the night. From the ledge, we ascend climbers left to reach a ridge moving upward and slightly to the right. This ridge has some 5.5 moves, but on solid rock. This may be the crux of the climbing portion itself, but it can still be done with relative ease and regular boots with an overnight pack. Above this ridge, we got a visual of a cairn denoting the ledge leading to Black Tooth Notch. This is important because the best ascent in the mid and late season will require getting to this notch. From this point, we climb towards the right on Class 4 terrain until reaching the summit. Cascades, the views are fantastic. The wildfires burning near North Gardner were made more visible by a westerly wind, keeping the smoke away from us. Two bivvy sites also exist on the summit, which would make for a remarkable sunset and sunrise. To descend, we utilized the southwest couloir, which required three 30 meter repels to first reach the ledge for Black Tooth Notch, followed by three more 30 meter repels to reach the third class gully. The first summit repel is straight down the fall line, but the next two traverse climbers left to reach that ledge. We followed the ledge to the notch where the first repel begins into the southwest couloir. All three repels from here are pretty much straight down the fall line. This gully is extremely loose, so exercise extreme caution to avoid sending rocks down on others. Take it one at a time. A ways down the gully, a small ramp leads out to the left. From here, navigation is fairly straightforward. We hiked down a ways and then made a rightward traverse to reach the top of a low growth ridge line. This will begin open country and become a burned forest. Staying near the top of the ridge line will lead directly to the Park Creek Trail, where the 18 mile hike back to Rainy Pass begins. This is a mountain that lives up to its reputation. Climbing it will require a diverse set of mountaineering skills that must be well developed prior to making the ascent. The long approach will require excellent physical fitness, and as always, one must take caution that poor weather can make this route much more dangerous. That said, the climbing was pristine, the views were outstanding, and the isolation was unrivaled by most anywhere in the North Cascades. It is a climb I would highly recommend to experienced climbers with a wide set of navigational, technical, and decision-making skills. If you liked the video or found it useful, don't forget to subscribe.